We have 100 stacks of coins, each one consisting of $10. One entire stack is counterfeit and of course you do not know which one. But you do know a counterfeit coin is 1 gram more than it should. You can weigh the coins on a pointer scale. Yes, it looks like a big mess, but let's pretend for a while our scale can perform its job pretty well. We want to know what is the smallest number weighings necessary to determine which stack is counterfeit. Ideally, we would like to pick exactly the counterfeit stack at the first row and place it on the scale, but this is not possible because the probability to draw the counterfeit stack at the first row is very low. So let's apply the first tactic, let's make some experiments. Suppose we have to deal with 10 stacks only. We have the group and weigh these 5 stacks. Our scale will reveal a weight that is consistent with a group of stacks, which does not include the counterfeit one. So this is our first weighing. Let's now pick up 3 more and weigh them again. Our scale reveals this time a weight consistent with the absence of a counterfeit stack, which makes this our second weighing. As only two stacks are left, will it be sufficient to weigh one stack only to eventually determine the counterfeit stack for a total of three weighings? If we apply the same strategy to the set of 100 stacks, the number weighing will be larger, obviously. This triggers the question, how do we do to know what's smallest? We'll see in a moment how this word induces a kind of mental inertia. Let's apply the second productive tactic. Let's find a paradox. We notice that if we pick up one stack only at random, we might ideally identify the counterfeit stack with one weighing only. But the probability that this is counterfeit is very low. The paradox is therefore this, we want to weigh one stack only and 100 stacks simultaneously. That looks quite impossible. But I want to give it a try using a third productive tactic. Let's use fractionation, which is a technique that stems from neuroscience as the following example illustrates. Pick up a jelly pot and pour on its surface one drop of hot water at a time. As the number of drops increases, the depression produced by them becomes shallower. This is basically the same we observe when we taste a nice piece of jelly. If we repeat the experiment several times, pouring hot water off from different positions, we eventually obtain a pot characterized by many depressions and ridges. This fact implies that all the incoming drops of water will move through that particular ridge located in correspondence with the initial spoon's position. Our brain behaves in a similar way. If you replace the drops of hot water with the pieces of information such as a function, a theorem or a concept, the jelly surface with our working memory, then the jelly metaphor explains that our brain provides an environment for facilitating the self-organization of the information into patterns. Your task here is to divide this picture into four equal pieces, having the same area and shape. As you try to solve this challenge, your working memory will attend to that information that more closely matches the most familiar pattern formed in the past by your brain. As you notice, it is very difficult to find these four equal pieces starting from this picture. A common first solution involves dividing the shape as follows. And we usually end up playing with all the possible sets of divisions. We need to restructure the initial information through fractionation of the information. That is, we divide the original picture into 12 squares. Can you spot the four pieces? This is the final solution. Applying fractionation to the problem at hand involves picking up one aspect of the problem at a time, for example, a coin's material, shape, temperature, etc. And then seeking alternative ways of solving the paradox. Let's give it a try. The coin should be large to be counterfeit and small to be genuine.
suggests us to look at the shape rather than the weight. What about a coin's temperature? The coin should be hot to be counterfeit and at room temperature to be genuine. This suggests us to turn the solid state into liquid state and then measure the liquid depth inside a container. Hmm, it doesn't work. Although creative, we don't go that far. Our goal is to remove the paradox while leveraging only the scale and the stacks. How do we do that? We will use a fourth productive tactic. We seek out an aspect of our problem space having two features globally and one locally. Do you remember when I told you I would say in a moment about the inertia produced by the word smallest? Seeking out features globally and locally helps solve this problem. Each stack is made up of 10 coins, right? However, that's not fixed in the stone, and we can vary this number for each stack while weighing all the stacks simultaneously. It helps solve the paradox because we vary the number of coins per stack locally, but keep the number of stacks globally unchanged when we weigh all of them simultaneously up to 100. That's what happens, for instance, with a bike's chain, which is globally flexible but locally rigid. From the dynamics standpoint, a pendulum behaves locally in a different way than when it is joined to another different pendulum. The counterfeit stack can be therefore determined by one weighing only, which is quite unexpected. Because the smallest creates a kind of inertia that induces one to ignore the most ideal solution that is one weighing only. Okay, that makes sense, but how does the weight measured by the scale help us determine the number of the counterfeit stack? To see that, we run again a numerical experiment. We assume in this column the counterfeit number and we calculate the total weight of the first five stacks on the basis of this assumption. Let's explore more in detail the table to seek out a pattern. I have included a column showing the additional weight and you do not need to add the genuine weight. When you do it, you still obtain the same result. So can you spot the pattern in here? If we assume the counterfeit to be the number 2, then the additional weight is 2. If we assume the counterfeit to be the number 4, then the additional weight is also 4 and so on. In other words, which stack is counterfeit seems to be determined by the additional weight. Does it hold true for every natural number? This requires us to convert this conjecture into mathematical terms using induction to show the additional weight we measure through the scale points to the counterfeit stacks number for every natural number. There exists a weak and a strong induction, as you know. A weak induction involves proving the base case and the induction step, that is, that whenever we assume that property holds for n, this implies the property holds true for n plus 1. Establishing the base case is similar to knocking down the first of a series of dominoes, whereas proving this implication is a bit like showing the falling domino knocks down its neighbor in a kind of chain reaction you have seen many times. However, the additional weight which corresponds to the counterfeit number is the set of natural numbers itself. So it is self-evident how the base case and the inductive step are both true, which guarantees the smallest number of wings required to identify the counterfeit stack is 1. Moreover, the stack is determined by using the additional weight irrespective of the stack's number.